the human body to express itself so that people could heal and be well. Naturally, without drugs, without surgery, he used his hands. So a few small instruments at his table. And I saw miracles happening and I heard testimonies from all of these people. And he didn't even have a scalpel and there was no blood and no machinery. And he was just using his hands, aligning the spine, aligning the nerve, or the, the nervous system by removing pressure from the nerves, by aligning the bones of the back, safely and gently. I saw little babies getting adjusted. And then old men, old men and old women, 80, 90 years old, all getting this adjustments of their nervous system and their spine, smiling. And another thing, the man looked like he was enjoying what he was doing. And that was surprising to me. I'm from a country town where people only complain about work. Nobody waits for Monday looking forward to go to work. But this guy was happy. Fun. I didn't know anybody truly happy <laughs> at the time. You know, really enjoying life. His staff was skipping around. I was thinking to myself, this is white folks. White folks just must be jittering around. <laughs> but he had a genuine love for what he did. And I remember him telling me, he says, listen, I want to die giving an adjustment for someone, giving my all to another person who could live longer, better, and greater for this sacrifice and contribution that I'm giving to them called a chiropractic adjustment. He said his last thought is he wants to give an adjustment and kill over and die. To him, that was fulfillment, satisfaction for him. I left and went to Atlanta, Georgia. I enrolled in chiropractic school. I literally forced myself into the school because it was after the time when they, they were taking the injury. But I showed up anyway. I literally waited in the uh, dean's office for three days. I went there, sat there all day long until they made an exception to enroll me in the school late. Shut up all day long? Three days straight. Three days straight. Because they had told me that I shouldn't come because the school term had already started. I told them, you don't understand. I, was my call. I, have to come. I was dying in my own blood. I asked for a second chance. And I made a promise to be obedient when my spirit said, go, yes, sir. There would be no question about that. And here the administrative people in the offices are telling me that there are rules and regulations and systems and procedures to that allow. The rules don't apply to you. Well, they apply to me, but they don't apply to the creator that is working Absolutely. through me. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. okay. So uh, I showed up there. I remember the lady's name was Becky. She ran the administrative office. And she was a heavy chain smoker and she had a dog. And on the third day of ignoring me, she was, and we made, started making conversation about her dog. I had a dog named Mindy, a white Eskimo Spitz dog. And she had a dog that looked similar. And we started building rapport. Right? She thought I was crazy sitting in the office there. Because she's just saying, listen, young man, you're just wasting your time. This is impossible. On the third day, the, the, a gentleman walks into the office and walks right into Becky's office. You can see he was a big man and didn't knock him where he was going. And he looked at me as he walked in, and I could hear him when he walked through the door. He was like, the guy sitting in the office there. And I heard her telling him, oh, this guy, he thinks he's going to get in. I told him it's too late. And uh, he, he says that he has to start school right away. And uh, he comes out, and I tell the man my story. I said, you sit in there three days. You have to get in. Oh, yeah, I'm smiling at him. I'm just commenting. I said, listen, yeah. look okay. at these wrappings. And I still had bandages. But my wounds hadn't completely, completely healed yet. And say, like, listen, you know what I'm saying? I'm still looking around here. You, know what? You, you, you need to call Dr. William Ashford and tell him what I saw in his office. And then you tell me I should go back to Virginia and wait till next semester. Not happen. And he was the dean. Wow. And he made it happen. And I enrolled and started school after two to three weeks after school had already began. And I went through my four years of postgraduate education. I had to do undergrad, some undergrad work, and then enter into the doctorate program, postgraduate doctorate program. And I spent four years getting my doctorate degree. I graduated as one of the younger doctors in my school. And as I was going through school, I began to keep asking questions. You know, the quality of your life is always proportionate to the quality of your questions. So if you don't seek, knock, and ask, Consistently, then the door shall not be open. The quality of your life is proportional to the quality of your questions. Interesting. So, it's 
lawful is a law that if you ask, it shall be given, and if you knock, it shall be opened, and if you seek, you shall find. But if you don't seek, knock, and ask, then you shall not find, and it shall not be opened to you. That's a principle my mother had taught me as a young boy. So asking was habitual. Waiting and hearing the answers, being aware of the answers, and then to being obedient to uh, surrender and get rid of fear to take action consistent with the answer to the questions is where most people and most of your listeners are going to fail. Most of them are going to fail simply because they want an easy answer. So when the right answer comes, they ignore it. They kind of run. And their fear of change and the fear of the unknown will keep them from taking consistent action towards the voice, that intuition that leads and guides them. And there they'll be, stuck in what they think is their own victimization, unwilling to explore and see and allow themselves to be used to create awesomeness. But once you do that enough, you'll begin to be aware of what that intuition is, and you can begin to have more faith and confidence in it. And you can be obedient to it. And then you become worthy of a higher vision, a higher purpose, and it grows the vision, the purpose, the significance, the uh, all, of that, all that begins to grow stronger, stronger, stronger. It becomes like a locomotive train that's building speed and momentum. You begin to get confidence in yourself, courage, uh, and obedience. And you step out into the deep more often and you become comfortable being uncomfortable. Being uncomfortable becomes a way of life. Then you can be used. Then you can be, uh, then you're vulnerable enough humble enough and moldable enough to be used and molded. It's interesting um, the metaphors you're using because uh, uh, I remember while I was in Korea I had a potter trying to help me mold a, a pot of things and you know they have this thing they put the clay on which moves like really fast yes. and while it's moving fast it's easy to just put your arms around it and it makes it easy to mold it into the shape that you want and you know after you get that shape up you just pick it up and then it dries off and it stays there. So, you know, while you're moving, it makes it easy to be shaped up just like you're talking about. The more action, the more movement, the easier it is to mold. Good stuff. Until you dry. When you dry, you become brittle, you become hard, unpliable, unmoldable. You can no longer be used, you can no longer be changed, you get stuck in your comfort, easy, easy to break. Fragile. So you must always go back and add water. You must always remain moldable, pliable, usable. Remain vulnerable, willingness to be vulnerable. I call it absolute vulnerability. Most people run from vulnerability. I prefer it. That's when you can be led, when you can be used. I have more confidence in that intuition, that voice that speaks and guides me than I do in my own confidence and certainty. Things unfold and it tends to manifest for you when you can be used, when you can uh, stay pliable and flexible, you can endure the storms, you can endure the, the, the treacherous terrains, the circumstances that come to test you and challenge you. So why God? That's another fascinating story. All my life I have been called an African American. I hadn't hardly been out of my state, much less out of America. But they kept, every time I filled out a form, I checked that box, African American, African American. There was Caucasian, there was Asian, there was Latin, Black Americans, there was European, there was uh, all of this, Chinese, and then there was African American. I've been trained all my life to check that box. And one day, I just literally uh, began to think about what, what's the African side of my African Americanism? You know, they don't teach it in school. They kind of give you some small chapter about Africa. You don't dive deep into the painful history of, nobody teach African Americans about their roots. Like they don't really teach Ghanaians or Africans about their ancestors that ended up in America. There's a complete disconnect between the two. We don't know each other. 400 years of being apart, learning different cultures, and evolving has, has erased our memory of one another. So I read about a little bit about this brain drain that uh, we have this continent called Africa and a billion people over there 
It is the last frontier or the most neglected continent on the planet. And even its own experts, its own professionals were leaving that, were leaving there going to greener pastures where I was, supposedly the land of milk and honey, <laughs> America. And um, I said, well, you know, because remember that all near-death experience. I was looking for significance. I was looking for impact. I'm looking for big and bolder, bigger and bolder the, the vision and the goal and the, uh, the idea, the more inspired I am because that's what I feel like I owe to make this life worthy of that second chance. So I was inspired to take my new gifts and talents and reinvest it into the land of my ancestors, whom I didn't know much about, whom I only knew in theory that I came from Africa, but I didn't know any Africans. Never been to Africa. I don't even really know where it is on the map on the globe. I didn't know I didn't do much research before coming here. So, but obedience. You may think it's courageous. It's obedience. I didn't know a single person on this continent. I had a friend that was gonna meet me in Ghana and we were gonna try to do some chiropractic stuff together, but I didn't know any good hands. Didn't know anybody who resided in Africa. Didn't have any relatives that were African directly. Uh, and I bought a one-way plane ticket. And I, on Ghana Airways, on June 2nd, 2000. I would have came earlier, but my mother made me promise that if I'm gonna follow my dreams and, and do the crazy and her only son was going off to a land that he didn't know anybody. She at least wanted me to wait until after to the Y2K. Remember the, the year 2000, everybody thought the world was going to come to an end. The planes were going to fall from the sky. The planes didn't fall from the I sky. The Y2K. <laughs> the computers didn't crash. Did and that. obviously, by us sitting here talking now, the world did not come to an end. So I bought that one-way plane ticket on Ghana Airways, and I took that flight through 10 hours, and I landed here in Ghana. I got out at the airport here and began a journey put myself up into a hotel in what I now don't know is La Paz area. I stayed there for a few days. Eventually met some people. They showed me where I could rent a house. I went in a, a room, not a house, but a room in the uh, first floor of someone's house in Mataibo. Wow. First so you just, you just came straight into the hustle. Go right into the house. middle of town. I, I put me in the... Uh, Man, right Wow. Yes. Wow, first line. Climb up the hill there. Okay. Turn left the top of the hill, going towards down to Zongo. Zongo, yeah. And the lady had a house there. She was bringing out a room. I ran out of room there. Do you remember how much you were paying for the room at that time? No, I don't. It, was, it wasn't much. It was but I didn't have much. Very low. I didn't come from, uh, I wasn't born from civil school in my mind. Matter of fact, when I landed in Ghana, all I had to my name was 1,200 United States dollars. I had a plastic, broken plastic spine to show people what the spine is about. I had an old laptop computer and a suitcase with my clothes in. A whole lot of vision, a whole lot of passion, and a whole lot of obedience. That's all. No friends, no relatives. Take on the African dream. That's it. No friends, no relatives, no, no contact, no, no serious contacts, nothing. Ready to save the world. I was on the road. I had, I was, I really looking back, I, it, you know, people, I actually thought I could change the world. You know, I, I, just, I bought into that hook, line, and sink. <laughs> the motto of my school, my university, was to give for the sake of giving, to love for the sake of loving, to serve for the sake of serving. And I remember uh, Anne Rand, one of my favorite authors, had written a book uh, called Atlas Shrug. And she said something in that book, I think she's been quoting someone else, that I actually bought into. Now, I don't suggest that everybody be as radical and as naive as I was then. Because there was a lot of naive, I was very naive, I was very young, and a lot of it was just youthful dream. I'm glad I didn't know it was just a dream then, or I wouldn't have taken the action. But Anne Rand said something, she says, never doubt that a small group of change the world. Indeed, they are the only ones that ever have. That ever have. These stay committed. I remember that line. And I, I believe that. It made sense to me. 
Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Indeed, so I think it's a small group of committed people. Yes. I think Do you know that I just gave that quote on Sunday? Wow. On Sunday at Toastmasters. Ah. I just said that quote on Sunday. Small group of committed people. Wow. This is this is this is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. So I chose Ghana because it, I chose Africa because I was trying to reinvest this, my gifts and talents back into the land of my ancestors, my, our, our mutual forefathers, most of which died and was thrown overboard in the ocean before they arrived in America. They built America. The labor force that has built America into superpower were Africans. And 400 years later, your forefathers had children, they had children, they had children, they had children, and somewhere along the way they had me and others like me. But you don't remember me. There's been so so many years apart that you don't know and recognize each other. I don't speak the language. My head is taken on a different form. It's you know, it's supposed to be flat. It's like the hands, hands are flat. Mine has sticking out, pointing out. So I don't speak the language. The head texture is different. Yes. You know, I've been you lost your kink. Yeah, lost my kink in this a bit. <laughs> uh, you know, so we've been mixed over the years to where we've forgotten each other. And I was trying to reconnect that, to try to reconnect my lineage to its roots. Because as an African American, you don't have any roots. Where are you from? I mean, who are you? You're a guest in America, you're a guest in Africa. You don't really know where you are. You don't have any foundation, you don't have any heritage you can go back and really trace it look at what characteristics, what traits should be passed on. You know, it's, it's a bit of a lostness. It's a mutt. We're a mutt. We're mixed with so many things, but we can't identify any of them. The only thing I can identify was the Africans. Only because of my skin color and the name I would have been labeled African American. So I arrived, I chose, so that's why I chose Africa, but I chose Ghana because it was English speaking and I was coming to pioneer a new profession. I was expanding this awesome healthcare system called chiropractic around the continent of Africa, starting with Ghana, and I needed to be able to communicate. So English was important. They had declared English as the official language of Ghana. Uh, it was politically stable. It was safe. It was, uh, it had no chiropractic. It had a lot of possibilities for growth in the future. And it was on the ocean. Ask the right questions to get and gain knowledge. I don't know how much more I can stress about it, and I, I have to commend Dr. Mann for stressing about that, because that's how we really create knowledge. We need to live in the moment, and we need to keep asking questions. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Look out for more, part three, of the interview with Dr. Mann. Stay empowered.